podcast. We've got the whole squad of four here, uh, including Eric and Megan, not Blaze and Jesse, but that's okay. Yeah, you can tell it's been a long time <laughs> since we've done this. I thought I had glasses now. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, we haven't gone remote in like a year, so a couple of things out of date on the list, but we are uh, we are here. We are live today, even with the snow going on outside. Uh, to talk a little bit of uh, trade deadline, almost a week removed from the actual trade deadline, how guys are settling in, how guys have uh, worked out or not worked out so far. Obviously, a lot of season left to go, but should be a fun show either way. Uh, if you are not a diehard, we did release a piece a couple of days ago that talked about some of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, go check that out. Go read it uh, for AJ's and Megan's and my thoughts on some of the trade deadline stuff. But uh, we'll get into some other things as well. <clears throat> I wanted to start here. Team-wise, who do you all think has had the best trade deadline now that we've seen six days of it? Mm. Who's first? Okay, um, I guess I guess I'll just the layup here is Vegas, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we haven't we haven't really gotten to see all of them in action, um, but Anthony Manta, Noah Hannafin, those are guys that are, at our, that are actually playing right now. That helps them. I think Noah Hannafin, uh, for my money, has been pretty good uh, for them so far, <clears throat> and he fits in with them wonderfully, but. Tomas Hurdle, when he whenever he gets healthy and he comes back in this regular season, is going to really help them, and he just changes the math for them so much. You know, going going from Jack Eichel and William Carlson to Jack Eichel, William Carlson, and Tomas Hurdle, and whatever iteration their forward core ends up being in, uh, it just it just changes it the the dynamic of that team so much that I think that the easy answer here for me the easy answer is Vegas. I think the alternative answer that we were all hesitant to immediately say is Colorado, just because there's an obvious bias on this podcast. But I think to AJ's point, because we haven't gotten to see Hurdle with Vegas for right now to answer that question, I think it is pretty realistically Colorado. And it's just because in three games since acquiring these players, they've won three straight. They've won the last five straight, so they were already building something. But it's been a good showing from some of these new players in a depleted abs lineup. And I think that hurdle will change the game for Vegas and we can very easily talk about it being him, but just looking around the league, like I know people were critical of me for suggesting that Elias Lindholm to Vancouver was a big piece at the deadline because it didn't exactly happen at the deadline. But for my money, Lindholm has not had the impact on Vancouver that I expected him to have. And so that would be someone I'd entertain in this conversation. I still think Vancouver is one of the best teams coming out of the West, but just evaluating deadline acquisitions or deadline-esque acquisitions, it still feels like it's pretty handily Colorado. And it's because of what the early returns of Middlestat has shown. And it's what so easily Yakov Trenin, how he has fit into Colorado systems has been impressive. I don't think that their PK is necessarily unique to them, but it is kind of an aggressive PK that he has fit in so well and has been able to make an impact in that way. And even seeing Trennan and Duhame play up in a second line role kind of unexpectedly, that's not what they were brought into Colorado to do and have the success that they've had. It all points to a well scouted deadline from Colorado that I think Again, once Hurdle joins Vegas, we can have a new conversation. But for right now, I think Colorado really hit a lot of this out of the park. Yeah, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going hands down Colorado. Not being a homer here. It's just, I think they had done their homework. They had done their, they addressed, you know, their needs. And I think coming out of that break, um, things didn't go well. I I think before that, it kind of camouflaged it a little bit. You know what I mean? Where you're like, you're winning games, so maybe you're like, eh, I don't know. And then coming out of the break, you know, shit hit the fan a little bit. And then 
that game in Nashville, I think we were all mad. And then they were all mad. I think all the players were mad. I think it was a slap in the face a little bit like, okay, we, we got to do, you know, whatever they were in the midst of doing, you don't just pick up the phone that day and things happen. So obviously they've been talking, but they nailed it on the head. You know, they, they nailed it with the guys they needed. Um, do aim, uh, training guys like that, you know, obviously no one in the back pocket that LOC was probably done for the year. Um, but Parisi, you know, like obviously the few weeks before knowing that their depth was not, uh, up to snuff, need a little more snarl, a little more sandpaper, you know what I mean? Um, and, and obviously the, the, the glaring hole, the second, second line center and Rigel was not a fit. And then I think unloading that and there's two folds to that middle stats fit in real well. We all knew it was going to work. And, you know, in a sense that you have an extra signing Devontae's at the start of the year, you knew Bowen Byron was gone, which is fine. And then they, they went and, and filled the hole that middle stat was needed to make them a different lineup. And I think you saw it yesterday. It makes them a different lineup. Once they're healthy a little bit down the stretch here, coming down like the next few days, it will be different. But it was something that I, they, why I say they're the winners is because they, they really nailed exactly what they needed to accomplish. And they did. And they swung and they weren't scared. And in the midst of it, you lose a good player and a popular player in Bo Byron. But you did what you had to do in order to give yourself a shot to go win. Uh, where I think coming down the stretch last year, like, okay, you know, after winning the year before, like, yeah, you're fighting to get in, and but you know it's like just by the skin of your teeth. I don't know why it was just a weird year. Next thing you know, you're out in seven in the first round. This year, if they didn't make those moves, I would have told you, and I felt, oof, this could be a tough postseason again. Now, with what they made, and I'm not afraid to say it, and I'll say it again, now I do believe they come out of the West. I think a lot of hockey's to be played here in the next few, whatever, weeks, months, but I think they're ready for a battle. They're ready to attack everything. And the only thing, and we'll talk about it later, is goaltending. You know, and then did you outscore your problem? I don't know. We'll see. I think part of the conversation here is trade deadlines are relative, right? You're looking at what other teams did and comparing if the Abs or Vegas or whoever it is have done better. And particularly when you look at the Abs direct competition in Dallas and in Winnipeg, I think you compare these and go, okay. Winnipeg goes out and gets Sean Monahan, but the Avs get Casey Middlestat. Winnipeg goes out and get Colin Miller, but the Avs get Sean Walker. I understand Bowen Byram's involved there. That changes the math a little bit. To me, Colin Miller is not a big needle mover. Winnipeg goes out and get Tyler Toffoli. The Avs get Trennan and Duhame. Maybe Winnipeg wins that trade a little bit. You look at Dallas's side of things. Yes, they go out and get Chris Tanev. They don't do a whole lot else. It feels like the teams the Avs are directly competing with, the Avs did better than at the deadline. I agree. I I think when we're going to talk about middle stat, um, it's only been a couple of games, right? So I'm I'm really I'm really like let's keep in mind very small sample sizes here, but. Uh, have you felt that the defense has been any different without Bowen Byram? Not really. Obviously, they replaced him with Sean Walker, so it's not like they just took Bowen Byram out and he's just gone. And that's, you know, that's just a hole in their lineup. They replaced him, but they went out and they were able to find a replacement. Okay, great. Follow-up question. Have you felt the forward core was different with Casey Middlestad? Yes. Pretty significantly, right? And it's not just Casey Middlestad, of course. It's not just him. There is Brandon Duhame and Yakov Trenin. A couple of guys that I thought... <laughs> I thought they were good fits. To, to, to date, I think they have been really good fits. I was expecting, certainly in Duhame's case, a few more limitations than what we've seen. We'll put it that way. Yeah, and that's Duhame is the guy where I'm like, I'm over the moon about Brandon Duhame right now. I'm like, give him a new deal. Like, this is, I'm good. I don't need to see anything else. I'm happy here. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised at how good it's been, but I, I am cautious that it is one week. It is yeah. three games that they've played. 
I am really excited to see how they match up against Edmonton uh, this weekend because I think that will be very telling. I think to give a shout out to Eastern teams too, since this has been very West heavy, I thought Florida had a decent deadline. They get Tarasenko and honestly, that was sort of Tarasenko's choice. It's not like yeah. masterclass for Florida, but also they get the captain out of Buffalo and Uposo. And then the Hurricanes, they get the Gensel winger addition from a name that was pretty popular. And they get a Kuznetsov who I, I think still has value as well as a player. Um, you know, coming out of an interesting position. Um, so those are two teams that I thought did some pretty interesting things out East, but I still feel like East West Colorado's moves are still the best and most likely to make an impact. Also just the best in terms of front office management, like Tarasenko going to Florida was again, Tarasenko's choice. Whereas Middlestat was a player that wasn't necessarily even being shopped at the deadline. They were fielding calls out of Buffalo and Colorado had to wheel and deal to get him here. And I think yep. that is an understated part of the deadline for Colorado. And then somebody's talking about Duhame, like how come they didn't keep him up in Dallas? I mean, in uh, Minnesota. Uh, very simple. They have very similar players in Dewar and guys like that. You know what I mean? That guys that were coming in and coming out. And you don't know what he's going to be commanding money-wise. You don't know what the negotiations were, and you know, and maybe they're like, you got to remember, they're in buyout. They're in, they still got what, a few more years of the buyout. <laughs> one more <laughs> full year. Yeah. You know, so it's one more full year, and that hurts. And and he's probably a casualty of that. You know, I mean, I think if you do a dissectation of their 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 scheme and their cap, whatever. Again, I'm not the best at that. You guys are way better, but he might be a, a victim of that. And why he was, he was a very popular teammate. They knew exactly what they had. He was very popular in, uh, in Iowa, I remember in Iowa and Timmy army and those guys and Cody McLeod ex as, you know, raving about him. And, and there's guys you watch in the American league and, and you go back to three years ago and you're like, they're going to play or three, four years ago, they're going to play in the NHL. You know what I mean? And I remember that was one of them that everybody was talking about. I was like, Hey, he's got to fit it wherever he goes in the NHL. He's going to do it right. And, this is a guy, you, if you ask him to do more, he'll give you more. But I think he knows what he is, and, and he pitches a few innings here and there. But um, but to your point, AJ, I want to get back to something. You were talking about it's not just Casey Middlestad. It's it's Duhame. It, it's Trennan. And then and, and Walker's been awesome. You know, you talk about activating and everything. He's just been – he's awesome. He's fun. He's fun to watch. He, he leaves it on the ice. But you're missing one player. Who is it? It's a quiz. Uh, I mean, are you talking about Val Nachushkin? No. Well, yeah, we we forgot. <laughs> he we was all kind of a it. deadline ad too. Yeah. I mean, we all forget. No, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to make a point here, is addition to subtraction. Like, and I'm here to, I'm not here to pick on him. But when Rigel's not there in your lineup, he, he was an anchor. He wasn't a fit. It, it was just like uh, stuck out like a sore thumb. You know what I mean? So now it makes the addition of middle stat that much better because he fits in so much better. And then you don't have the nuisance. And I'm, I'm going to use that word, you know, of, of Rydro being in the lineup, which was, which was tough to watch on, on many nights. So I think those guys been added. It's been awesome, but he also took out something that was an anchor, you know? So yeah. just, a, just, just an extra player that way. It unchained McKinnon and Bednar's flexibility to play the top line, just a little bit less. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just a little bit more. And I think that's the bigger picture of all of these additions and subtractions. Well, I think last night was a good example of that because mm -hmm. you saw the abs weren't just riding the top line into the ground during the third period. They're kicking the shit out of Vancouver throughout that third period. And it's because their top line is going, the Casey Middlestat line is going, and the Ross Colton line is the one that ties the game. Like, yep. it kind of got lost in all of the 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 other things that went on in our post game pod last night the ross colton line ties the game yep they were the ones that got it done you know the the, the those top two lines that we did that i just mentioned had good shifts and were building towards it they got it done they're the ones who, who put the puck in the net briefly it's almost like ross colton is wildly more effective as a third line center well, and, and it had been a while since we had seen it. And e even last night you saw it was with Kiviranta on that wing. True. It's not even it's not even one of the 
you know, the, one of the guys that's going to be in the lineup at some point in a in, a, in a Lekkonen or a Parise uh, or a Nikolai Kovalenko at some point. Like, like you're talking about, this is Kiviranta, a guy that probably isn't in your lineup in a healthy forward lineup, which just may never happen given how this year has, has, gone, has played out. But uh, they got it done. And for, for the Avalanche to have that, oh, we've got a guy that's that's going to be a Hart Trophy finalist this year at the top of our lineup. But, oh, by the way, our second and third lines are also kicking the shit out of you. That's tough. Like that, how do you, how do you match up with that? You know, getting, getting Elias Lindholm for Vancouver didn't do anything. Elias Lindholm and, and they were actually looking to move him again at the deadline. Right. The Elias is last night. Lindholm and Pedersen in Vancouver didn't do anything. They, they didn't contribute anything to them, uh, to, to them getting to where to, to the three, nothing lead. And then to, to try and stem the tide of them getting rocked in the second half of the game. The Avs just bowled over them, and it was not the Nathan McKinnon show. Yeah, the top line ended up with the majority of the scoring, but uh, that is, on a Sega Baba, the way that the Avalanche played last night, I really, really want to see them build that momentum against Edmonton on Saturday night in what is going to be uh, a raucous atmosphere. You, you bring us to a good point. What is six wins in a row? Because right now the Avs are a wagon. Wagon. <laughs> six is what? Eric's usually the guy who comes up with these. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I think six. Um, I don't know. We should leave it to the community to decide what six is. Yeah. I'm, I'm open to it. You guys put Thank it you. in chat. Yeah. If we get to that point, they can figure out what seven, eight, what, you know, so on, so forth. Let them figure it out. Figure all that out. While you're figuring it out, make sure you crack a chill Coors Light. Uh, the beer created for chilling. I guarantee you just step outside. Those mountains will turn blue real quick on your Coors Light today. Uh, delicious beer. Awesome to hang out with one at any time, whether you're watching an abs game or chilling at home on a snow day. Uh, go get yourself some, or just stay at home and get it delivered. Uh, you know, I maybe depending on how bad the snow is in your area, don't get it delivered today, but when the roads are clear, get it delivered. Uh, go to CoorsLight.com slash DNVR, and Instacart will send you some Coors Light right to your front door when you purchase it. You don't even have to get up off the couch to get your Coors Light. Go check it out. Go get yourself some real Colorado beer. Uh, of course, please drink responsibly. Golden Colorado Coors Light Brewing Company. Uh, and then throw down some bets on Bet365. Go to Bet365, download the app today, and use DNVR365 as the code when you sign up. Bet $5 on any NHL game. Uh, you get $150 in bonus bets just for signing up, betting that 5 bucks if you use the DNVR365 code. So get it on that. Get $150 to bet on whatever you want. A whole slate of hockey games to uh, to gamble on tonight. Maybe bet on New Jersey over Dallas if you're looking for help for the Avs. Uh, bet on Minnesota over Anaheim and Calgary over Vegas if you want some spicy uh, wild card stuff to start happening. Of course, a ton of East games, too, if that's more your speed. Uh, do it with Bet365. When you do gamble with Bet365, you must be 21 or older, physically located in Colorado. And if you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER today. Uh, second period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast. AJ has put together a top five of the best five trade deadline moves specifically so I can far. Use, I can use, I can use. So we're going to move on from team specific stuff to actual individual players top five so far. I did take a peek at this. He, he means performance so far. So it's like a tone wash hurdle will not yes. be on this list. Correct. How have the guys done in the week since the deadline? <laughs> Um, I didn't know I was doing this today, so I put this together in, I think it was like three minutes. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if you guys, uh, if you guys have strong disagreements or tell, if I forget somebody obvious on here, um, you know, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, I guess, are we, are we ready to rock with it? Number five, Yakov Trenin. I really, um. So I think Brandon Duhame has been fun. He's been interesting. 
Uh, he's been helpful, but Yakov Trenin, uh, his his face-off work on the PK, his PK work in general, it's been really, 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 really good. Uh, I don't think it can continue, can continue at this level long term, but my goodness, I feel great about it uh, so far. He's been an awesome role player, and also it's an abs pod, so, you know, bite me. I'm picking an av. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an interesting conversation on a guy who, let's be honest, the expectations of him in Colorado is not to be particularly productive. There has to be some yeah. there, like not trying to beat around that bush. But he's come in. He's immediately energized the Avs penalty kill. He's been money in the face-off circle on the penalty kill for the Avs. When you're talking about the Avs looking at a specific problem as a team they knew they had, Yakov Trenin comes in, and, and Brandon Duhame too, but Trenin more specifically, just solves it perfectly for them. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> like even Not just... Trenin. No, sorry, go ahead. Go. No, go, 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 go. Through two periods last night, you look at the shot share, and it's kind of insane how much one came from that second line alone, but Duhame and Trenin just individually. And I know that there wasn't necessarily finish, but that is valuable possession that challenges goaltenders, shot blockers alike, and just ultimately helps the possession game for Colorado. It is annoying. It's a nuisance. And I think it is why with middle stat that line worked so well because they're both puck hounds and he's also willing to be pretty active in the offensive zone but obviously also a reliable two-way player it just fits so well in colorado and if he continues to take shots at that clip they're going to go in eventually i i don't know we saw logan o'connor do this too but they're going to go in eventually is my feel that there's also going to be some production that trickles out of him in addition to all of the other great things that he brings to his game I told AJ the other day, like four or five years ago, I'm on a freaking Tuesday night in Milwaukee or something. He was just like, eh, you know, I don't want to go to that game. And and I remember I fell in love with Jakob Trenin there. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy's like – and you got to remember, go back. Go back. And this was when Val was coming out of his, you know, zero goals in 100 games and, you know, where – why did the Avalanche sign this dude, Nakushka, whatever, whatever you call him. Um, and then I'm looking, and then Val was just playing so good and so good. And then I remember watching Trent, and I'm like, this is my poor man, like, Nikushkin. And if you read my reports, that's what it's been for the last four or five years. And I'm not going to say I'm going to compare him to, to Val, but I'm going to say that there's a lot of similarities. And who knows where he can get to. Uh, and there's another reason why Nashville in a playoff race let him go, because they knew they could fetch something. And at the end of the day, he's going to command some money. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, this guy can do it all. Like, I don't know if I've said it before and I'll say it again. Like you can, it's not about fighting. I'm saying, but I remember him playing rough and tough and in the minors and, and having success. And then gotten a couple fights that, that week that I was there and I was like, man, this guy can play too. Like he, you know, what is he? You know what I mean? Cause he's, he's Russian and I didn't know his past. And, and all of a sudden he gets called up and go look it up. He buckled to Dan Ochara, you know, one of the only few guys in the history of, of Zdeno Charles Courier that Trenton buckles him, you know what I mean? Like, and he gives him one. So he's, this guy's not, he's not scared to, to get involved, to muck it up. He's a very smart cerebral player. That's why he's going to help this PK. And that's why he's going to help whoever he's going to play with. Uh, this was a huge pickup. Uh, I, I love the fact that you put him in there at five. And, and at the end of the day, like, who knows, you might end up at one. You know what I mean? Like when it's all said and done, that'd be awesome. I think it's going to be tough to, Top the two guys at the top of this list, but you never know. <laughs> Let's you, go to you've seen the list. We have it. That's yeah, true. Yeah. That's true. Number four, Vegas with Noah Hannafin. The uh the big piece they went out and got that is actually playing for them. Uh, Vegas is in an interesting spot, but it's no secret that uh Hannafin is going to help their back end a lot. Yeah, and I think uh when you have a you have Shea Theodore and Noah Hannafin and Alex Petrangelo on the same defense. Um, that's pretty good. Those guys are pretty good. And you put them all together. They're all big. They can all skate. Um, you know, just the way, the way that the, the way the Golden Knights actually play, 
you know, I'm I just I just think it's such a good fit for them and what I've seen of the Golden Knights so far, I've been I've really liked No Hannafin there. So um this was probably my bias towards defensemen, but I erased that bias towards defensemen and didn't put Sean Walker on this list. So again, <laughs> leave me alone. Well, I thought you had him in there. He he's helped out. Oh yeah, in a big way. He's gotten top pair minutes, two points in three games. I think that it was a pretty natural fit for him in Vegas and He's helping out in a couple different ways. He's getting on their second unit and a little bit on um, that top pair, as I mentioned, which I think is just why Vegas is one of the teams to keep an eye on and talking about who won the deadline because they got a little deeper up front, deeper on the back end, and then when Hurdle comes, it's just top end talent. That's going to be hard to deny. Yep. Here's what I'm going to say about Hannafin. Okay. Um, I really like the player. Uh, I was working with Calgary when we made that deal uh, to go get him with Lindholm out of Carolina. One thing that's awesome about Noah is his skating ability. Another thing that's awesome about him is he's barely 27 years old and he's got like 8,000 games played in the NHL. It's crazy. Like it, it, it's, it's absolutely nuts the amount of games and experience he has. And he's a fairly young man. Um, but here's what I'll say. If you're an Avs fan, that's a good thing. If you're a Vegas fan, that's not a good thing. And it's not a knock on Noah. It's it's just a harsh reality. If you go back to that series, Avalanche Calgary, which I remember very nicely, <laughs> boy, oh, boy, he did not look good. And that's probably – and, again, not just him. The whole team did not look good. Everybody and, and this new guy came in, this Kale McCarr guy, you know, that – who is that guy? Uh, next thing you know, like Calgary never touched the puck. It was it was embarrassing. It was bad. Like it was sad, and, and from Sean Monahan to Johnny Gaudreau to, to Noah and to everybody. Uh, but that's basically his postseason play. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, there was a little bit in the bubble and whatever it was. And I, again, I try to erase those days. But um, so yeah, average at best. You know what I mean? So we shall see. Just to back up Eric's point, playoff stats for Noah Hannafin. 27 games played, 8 points, no goals, minus 12, and an average of 21 minutes a night. No, not, not good. I'm just I'm just being honest. And do I like the player? Yeah. Do, would I make that trade? Yes. But reality is, is he's, you know, it's different than Jack Eichel. Like Jack Eichel, I never played one playoff game. So it was hard to say. Jack Eichel can't do it in the playoffs. He never played a game. Like, I, I, you, you were just assuming, oh, Jack Eichel, he'll fold in the playoffs. He never did. He was outstanding. But And I'm not saying Noah can't. I'm saying for the time that he's been there, it hasn't been good. I would also say the difference with him being in Vegas is that he doesn't need to be the top guy there. Absolutely. They have, they have a little better infrastructure to insulate him if things don't go as well. Absolutely. Um, Great and, point. And, try to hide him a little if, if things do take a turn but also you paid a you paid a decent price to go and get him you don't want them to take a turn um i do because i think that'd be hilarious but you know nothing against hannafin it's been a week in the games that i've seen i've watched two of them i thought it was pretty good so eh. oh i like the player playoffs will come when the playoffs come let's move on to number three yeah, so Vladimir Tarasenko in, in Florida. Um, Megan, uh, not knowing this list, had already kind of started to get into it a little bit. He's been really good in Florida next to some of their studs. So uh, I think he had, I think he just had a three-point game the other day. Uh, good fit yeah. and, and, and kind, of like fan, kind of like Hannafin in Vegas. He can, he can play on their top line without ever having to be their top player. Yeah, this made a lot of sense on deadline day, right? I know Tarasenko wanted to go there and whatever, but Florida really did need one more real goal scorer in their top six, and Tarasenko fit that perfectly. Yes, he's not the best player ever. He's going to have some defensive shortcomings. He's not the guy he used to be, yada, 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 sure. But he makes so much sense in Florida that I am not surprised by the start he's had with that team. Yeah, and... You know, no offense to old friend Evan Rodriguez, but exactly, <laughs> you're better. You're better having Tarasenko and Rodriguez than just Rodriguez. Yep, and 
that's that's where I think Florida did the math and the cost in trade was not a lot. So, you know, uh, early returns are good. Good player. Uh, moody player. Uh, I call that a moody player. Like, you know, he can disappear if he's not, eh, if he's not happy. It's, eh, you know, things have to go right for him. Uh, obviously, he's one. He's one in St. Louis. Uh, people were mad in Ottawa about the return. It, guys, I mean, honestly, guy's a free agent. Uh, he has a no move clause, not a no trade clause. No move. He can't go anywhere. They go up to him, hey, uh, we can trade you to Colorado, for example, and we're getting a first round pick. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing stuff out there, stupid. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't want to go. It's up to the player. You're in the right to get it, and you're the one that gave him the no move clause. Like, Zero move clause. That's on you. Like, you know, and then all of a sudden he's like, no, I'm only going to go to Florida. My kids, my, my wife, they live there. This is where I'm going. So if you're Florida, what are you going to do? Oh, we'll give you three first round picks. No, you're, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, okay, we'll give you a fourth, maybe two fourths. So what are you going to do? No, uh, you say, no, you have an unhappy player that's there the rest of the year. Why? So you take it and you move on. It's all good. Works all good. Always seems to be Florida with these guys who will only go one place. Yeah, with no state Tampa, tax. <laughs> no state tax, and Tampa Bay doesn't have any cap space for these guys anymore. So, <laughs> so there you go. Let's all go to Florida. Or a lot of yeah. it is. It's, it's, let's all go to Florida, Texas, and Vegas. Yep. Megan, I know you already talked about Tarasenko. Anything to add? No, not really. I, I think in – similar to what we've talked about with other players to what he gets to go there and be is a complimentary player to their top end. That's already established. Yep. Like Evan Rodriguez is out right now with something minor. And once he gets back in, it's just added forward depth with Kyle Poso on their third line right now too. It's just options for them to tinker around with. So wherever Tarasenko goes, if he continues to stay on that top line wing, I think he's a great fit there. He can be moved around wherever he is going to be most effective. They already have some effective players in that lineup that I think it is a good fit for Florida. And I'm curious to see how it goes. Like you can see the ice time is slowly ramping up for him there. So I think we'll get a fuller picture in a couple weeks time by the end of this regular season, what that looks like for Florida. Yeah. Florida was my team out of the East before the deadline. It's still my team out of the East after the deadline. So Nobody else out there certainly did anything to challenge them. It was so. a whole lot of bit piece moves for most of the East. Joel Edmondson, baby. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, number two, Casey Middlestad. Yeah. Uh, Colorado had one gigantic glaring weakness uh, that was really, really holding them back, and they watched the one of their direct counterparts in Winnipeg fill that exact same hole with the player already. Uh, who's also could have been on this list if I would have considered him a deadline acquisition. I didn't. Uh, I was being very semantics-based about it because neener, neener. Um, Casey Middlestat's been great. He, you know, the first game against Minnesota, eh. But in those two games since then, boy, howdy, has he looked really, really good. And the game last night in Vancouver, I think, I think was just the kind of performance that should get everybody really excited about what this could look like if things actually, if he finds that level on a, on a close to consistent basis, you know, seven out of every 10 games, he's at that kind of level. The avalanche are going to be really hard to beat. Yeah. There is. <laughs> it. I think the impressive part and this is similar to other guys we've talked about on this avalanche lineup is how quickly they have fit in so well to where it's not just, Oh, he's a talented player. He's going to be good. It's he does a lot of things that the Colorado avalanche like to do. And it, it's, it's not this, we said it at the deadline, right? You get a new player. It's really a 10 to 15 game stretch. You're looking at them for them to start figuring it out and, and be in part of the systems. We're three games in and it feels like they've been doing this for 40 games. I mean, yeah. it's all about a fit. Um, I'm in my daughter's room right now. See, that's why, like, I'm I'm using all <laughs> I'm at her makeup station right now. So I'm not a fit right here. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a good fit. You're right. He's here got. With the abs. He's a good. Yeah, he's a good fit with the abs. He's awesome. 
And we were begging for them to swing before the deadline was over. And Chris and, 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 and Joe and the crew and, you know, like the pro guys swung. They swung. And it, and it takes a lot of balls to swing. It's not that easy. Um, and you need a dancing partner, you know. Uh, this was one of the only, you know, the best hockey trade there was at the trade deadline. For me, it was. I mean, I try to remember if there was any – when I say trade, you, you, we all know what we're saying here, hockey trades, right? Not not a rental, not a – this was a forward for a D. Um, and at the end of the day, it makes the avalanche better. And and I see people, and then they look, and they go, oh, go bull scoring. Like, great, awesome. When you make that deal – you gotta remember, Buffalo's making that deal because that's a need, that's what they want, and that's what they want to do. They think they can spare forward, and they can solidify their D, and they have great Ds and Dalin and and Powers and, and all those guys. And they're like, "This is how we want to be built." And there's a reason why they're doing it. And then they feel that they're doing it for what they feel is their needs. And the Avalanche did that not because they don't like Bo and Byron. They have a glaring hole at two C. They want to go win the Stanley Cup, and they feel that by adding Sean Walker. You got to remember, they don't make that deal if they don't get Sean Walker. It's just, it goes, so there's two deals to it, you know. But Bob Byron can go score 10 goals in the next 10, 10 games. Awesome. Good for him. So that's awesome. It's great. You wish him the best. Like, he's a good kid. Like, awesome. And he's going to do well. And, and, and you got to remember, Buffalo, they're only a few points back. But at the end of the day, they're probably not going to make it. And then you're just playing loosey-goosey hockey. And every year, those teams do it. And then let's see in September and October how they do. You know, when, when when points really matter. And I'm not saying Bo. Bo was one of Stanley Cup. I'm not saying Bo. I'm saying the Buffalo Sabres. But Bo, hopefully, let's let's hope he scores 10 goals the, the rest of the year. It's awesome. You know what I mean? It has nothing to do with Casey Middlestad. You know, it's it's you've moved on. You swung. You made your team better. You got rid of an anchor by doing that, too. Obviously, those it's the same thing. It was all, it's a domino effect, right? You're, you're getting rid of Rigel, you're, which is an anchor. And then you're adding middle staff, which is a fit for you. You're losing a D, but you're adding Walker. And as we saw Walker, he's involved in every game and, and he's fun to watch and he's perfect for the F style. So they swung and, and they nailed it. It feels really good after three games. Yeah. All right. Number one. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> He's played so absurdly well since yeah. showing up in Buffalo. I mean, come on. Like, we all knew this was the top of the list, right? Because yeah. Bowen Byram has been awesome as a Buffalo Saber. He looks liberated. Yep. He just does. He looks he looks free to go and be the Bowen Byram that he might have had a chance to be in Colorado had Devon Taves and Kale McCarr not existed. But... That's great. Uh, and Eric said it like what he's doing in Buffalo. It, awesome. We don't, we don't need to do this forever about, Oh, won the trade, lost the trade. How are they doing against each other? You know, whatever it, it doesn't matter. We did that for a long time in the Ryan O'Reilly trade. And you know what happened? Ryan O'Reilly didn't do shit in Buffalo and JT Confer won a Stanley cup. <laughs> True. You know, you give it enough time and maybe something like that can happen here again. But uh, it's it's really just – Byron's been great in Buffalo, and there's no taking that away. You always wish he could have been this version of Bo and Byron in Colorado. For whatever reason, it wasn't happening. It just feels like – it got to the point where it felt inevitable that Byron was going to be the odd man out. His contract was the shorter term. He was going to want bigger role, more money, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. There was all – it was it was it, it was coming to a head at some point, um, and Sam Gerrard's play had spiked and gone so far up that him on a five million dollar contract was just for multiple years too valuable. Yep, he's he's locked in at five. We're not messing around. We're not trying to move that guy. Um, let let Bo Byram go and do what he's going to do, and he solves your your two C issue not for this year. Not for, oh, hey, you know, maybe Casey Middlestats, you know, he's going to this this run and maybe the next one. No, he's 25. You, you should have him. You should have minimum. him for the next. Yeah. Three more. Yeah. Yeah. At minimum, it should be three years. I, I say three to five years. It could be it could be significantly more than that. Yep. You're you're done looking. You got your guy. 
uh, it comes at the cost of Byram. I hope Byram kicks ass as a Buffalo oh, yeah. Saber. I hope he kicks ass, and I hope he gets a long-term deal there, and he gets everything that he couldn't have in Colorado except the Stanley Cup because he's not getting that there. You know who else wishes he kicks ass? Like, and I'll I'll talk on his behalf. It's, it's Chris McFarlane and the crew, and, and Jared Bender. He's a good kid. He's won a Stanley Cup there. He, he, he do. You're you're part of that team for life, and and you know what? He did well in those playoffs. He was awesome. So good. He was awesome. So this is not a guy that. Well, you're gonna see right now. Uh, it's a different atmosphere going to Buffalo. It's it's a totally different atmosphere than the Avalanche. The Avalanche is about every day about going to get that silver thing right now. And in Buffalo, it's not. And I'm not bashing Buffalo. I'm not. I love Donnie Granado. I love I love where they're going. And I, I picked them to make the playoffs this year. This kind of a setback, but they'll be there one day. You know, like but it's a different atmosphere right now till the end of the year. It's it's, it's so laid back. It's not the same. It's not so uptight like the Avs are uptight. You have to be uptight to win. I'll bash Buffalo. Yeah. Bowen Byron had been there for 45 seconds, and he's already their power play coach. So, yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. So, you know what? It, it good on him, and he's going to do well, especially the, the, this year because it's so liberating to play. I mean, it's you know, it's just it's free. Like it's like woo, you know. So he'll thrive in there. The opportunity just through three games is already more than Colorado could have provided him. He was on a third pair with Jack Johnson, and his ice time is already now top minutes, first power play unit, a unit that he just wasn't going to get to unless Kale McCarr was injured. And three goals and an assist in three games. He's taking shots. I think that he is a player that has always had profound confidence, but also needs to have it sort of fostered. And Buffalo has the opportunity to provide him with the minutes and the runway that he needs to really lean into who he is as a player. And I'm just proud to see him even doing it all on his offside. I think that was something he was steadily improving on throughout the course of this season in Colorado. It obviously didn't start great for him, but I just think that it's the best fit for him to be in Buffalo right now. And I also am rooting for Buffalo or Buffalo (laughs) bow. Buffalo bow. It it really is an interesting point. How much of Bo playing on that offside was a little bit of a showcase? He can do it with Bear. Just give him a chance. Yeah, right, exactly. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that was our bet 365 top five for the week. Uh, a bunch of abs on there one way or another. Uh, it was a fun one. I know there are some other good trades out there too, but I think it's a, job, a AJ. pretty fair take. For a, for a five-minute list put together by AJ. Well done. Uh, beyond Walker, Walker should have been there, AJ. Fight me. <laughs> Your beyond guy. that, guy. make sure you go get a top five burrito over at Illegal Pete's, all right? There's 12 different locations here in Colorado, including a new one that just opened up in Wheat Ridge. Uh, go get yourself some delicious queso from Illegal Pete's. Uh, yeah, hey, look at that. Even the, the scroll for Illegal Pete's is old. Happy hours from 3 to 8 p.m. now. They extended that bad boy. So uh, great times at Illegal Pete's. There's one right by the DNVR bar, too. If you want a pregame at Illegal Pete's, come to the bar, hang out for the game. It's always a great time, especially as the ramp up towards the playoff starts. Go get yourself some Illegal Pete's and their delicious happy hour margaritas. And then make sure you're saving yourself some money with American financing. Uh, they save their customers on average $854 a month by tapping into their home's equity and wiping out high interest credit card debt. Right now, mortgage rates are lower than they've been in a very long time. So it's a great time to get in on an opportunity like this. They might be able to get your loan closed in as fast as 10 days. So quick relief can come help you. Uh, you can call them at American Financing or rather call American Financing, excuse me, today at 303-695-7000. And you may even be able to delay your next two mortgage payments. That's 303-695-7000 or head over to AmericanFinancing.net slash DNBR today. NMLS 1823-34, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Third period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast. I wanted to flip it. Uh, we've had We've talked about the good. I want to talk about the bad a little bit. Uh, we also did this in our round table, but worst deadlines, who do we think had the worst deadlines? I want to make it a little bit harder than just saying San Jose though. 
<laughs> Can I say That's Mike funny. Greer specifically? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a tough day for him. It definitely was. Don't think there's any doubt about that one. Uh, I will go first. I'll take a team different than the one I said in our round table, though. I'm going to say the Arizona Coyotes had a truly terrible deadline for a team that tanked off the face of the planet, completely took themselves out of the playoff race, and really in the bottom five of the league is where they are. They get a fourth round pick, a fifth round pick, and a sixth round pick. And that's it. That's all they get for selling their players. Basically nothing of value. And not not a great haul for a team at the bottom of the charts that was looking to sell. I'll put it that way. And it's not like they didn't have pieces. I get it. Matt Dumba hasn't been any good this year. That one, fine. Whatever. But you really could only get that for Jason Zucker. You couldn't figure out a way to, to at least like get a third. The Avs paid a third for Brandon Duhame. And you 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 couldn't get that for Jason Zucker. That's that's crazy to me. Yeah, Nashville getting Beauvillier and Zucker is actually like kind of nice for them, but yep. it doesn't altogether look great for Arizona losing Dumba Zucker and stature to a different degree. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go uh somebody in the chat talking about the Leafs. I'm gonna go the Leafs. I I I you know, they didn't really do much. Um yep. I don't know. I think you, like Mac talking about it this week, and and Mac C Mac and and Nate McKinnon. You know, like you owe it to your core, like to 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 add a little bit. And I felt that you know they, they didn't really do much. I, only time will tell, right? And maybe they're saying, well, they've been doing this for a few years and never goes to anything. Then maybe your core is the problem. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you got to dissect a little more. So. We'll see. We'll see if that was the right move for them. And, and then I agree with LA. Uh, for me, LA had to address their goaltending. Um, it leaked out that, you know, Lynn Hall, uh, whatever, not Lynn Hall, but uh, this is the Allmark, uh, did not work out. And But then you got to have a plan B then. You know, I don't know. You got to figure it out <laughs> because it's a good team. Uh, it can be a dangerous team. Uh, but, but I, when the puck goes in, it's tough, and, and, and I do believe they didn't address their their needs. And, and again, you can say the same thing about Edmonton, but he's played good. I mean, Skinner's played good the last forty. So who knows? From the the viewpoint of Colorado, watching a team commit to going all in, I think what Toronto did is just unacceptable from a hockey organization at this deadline. You watch Sean Walker go to Colorado. You watch Noah Hannafin go to Vegas. Yeah. And you end up with Joel Edmondson, man. And and nothing against Joel Edmondson. He's a fine defender, but he's not on the level of a Sean Walker or a a Noah Hannafin. He's a seven. For a team that realistically, it's this year and next, and that's it. And then their core is getting blown up. They don't have a choice. The cap is coming for them. Pretty disappointing for me. I mean, they just re-signed Matthews and Nylander, so I think that they probably were looking at it and saying, we don't need to to go – crazy this year we can and that's my point you know we can we can wait on it till the summer we can wait another year or two to try i get what you're saying because they've got to figure out contract situation for mitch marner too to varus too yeah and yeah uh, f that guy (laughs) we're saying the same point yeah so i know i I think i think i think the team that i actually was really um I found it interesting at the deadline was St. Louis. They didn't do anything. Yeah. And that's a team caught squarely in the middle. As much as you can look at Calgary and be like, Hey, they did all this stuff. They didn't get enough for it. They picked the direction. They picked the direction and are going and are, and are going in that they're walking down that path at this, at this point. And that's, if you don't, I think that their, their overall vision is muddled, but at least in season, you you understood what was happening. I don't I don't get what the Blues are and what they're doing. They're old. They have a lot of guys signed to long term deals. There are a couple of guys that are signed to to there are a couple of their younger guys that are signed to long term deals are decent. But if those are your best players on your roster, we're seeing it right now. They're not good enough. They've gotten a, a good goaltending year. What are you doing? Yep. I, I just don't get it. 
They're... I don't understand what the plan is there because that's a franchise that has always tried to go for it, always tried to be aggressive. And I think that years of bad decisions and bad moves have finally caught up to them. They're just hamstrung. I don't think they I don't think that they can do much because Tory Krug and Nick Letty and these guys, they made bad choices on those deals and now they're just they're they have to just kind of eat it. It, it's still disappointing for their only deadline move to be giving away an AHL goaltender, right? That's yeah. the only thing they did. They didn't move Kasperi Kapanen. He's expensive on a waiver claim. All right, I can forgive them that. They didn't move Sammy Blay, an expiring UFA this year for cheap. They didn't move Marco Scandella on the back end, an expiring D for a reasonable price they could have retained if they wanted to. No Pavel Bucinavich deal? Yep. They just didn't do anything, literally. Yeah, I just, what's the plan there is is my question. And for a team that fancies, like, you look at all the other teams that they're kind of in that grouping with, right? Seattle's still kind of trying to figure it out. You could also have this a very similar conversation about uh, the Kraken. Mm-hmm. Like, what's up there? Um, but at least at least there's something, right? They've, they've got a couple of really young guys that are coming in. Um, Manny Beneers has had kind of a weird year. Shane Wright is still developing and, you know, whatever. But at least like, you could look at that and say, all right, that's our plan. Um, what are the Blues doing? Like, what's, you know, the, the teams that are around them, the Wild are stuck in cap purgatory. The Flames we just talked about, are the, they're selling to do what they can. I just don't understand where the Blues are supposed to be going. Um, and I found their deadline for an organization that historically is very aggressive in either – they make up their mind. And they it's usually, hey, we're going to go for it. Last year we saw them. This isn't it for us. We're going to sell off the guys. We're going to trade off the guys that we think can get us assets that are meaningful. And now they're just kind of like sitting around. I, I guess I'm just – their their deadline I found interesting to me because it, it it ran so counter to what they've been as an organization for a really long time under Armstrong and they might have just I'm I'm curious they fired their coach this year I think they've just lost the plot yeah the arch is still mine yes and Chad is asking <laughs> the arch is still mine <laughs> you get to Make- Pittsburgh in there too you know like. Yeah, they lose Gensel, but like Crosby seems to be pissed off right now. Um, you know, some say they didn't get enough for Gensel. I mean, who knows what what was out there? And then now today they lose their bobbleheads, right? You know, the Yager <laughs> bobblehead truck got stolen. I mean, when it goes bad, everything goes bad. No, Can you yeah. imagine that you're giving like fifteen thousand bobbleheads, but they don't show up. That's when there things are going wrong for the bobblehead black market. Is that a thing that exists? I don't know. <laughs> what are you doing? Twenty thousand Yager bobbleheads. Ask Gritty. <laughs> Gritty probably stole. Yeah. Megan, did did you have a pick, or did we cover most of the teams? No, it's definitely most of the teams, and I really echo Andrew's feelings about St. Louis. I've had criticism of how they've constructed their roster, even before the start of this season like Kevin Hayes is the addition over this summer is it doesn't really move the needle for me in what and it's no insult to Kevin Hayes he's a great complimentary piece but they were really counting on Thomas and Cairo to take big steps forward after those big contracts and they just didn't they're like he said like AJ said they're just not enough to carry the team on their shoulders and build the team around just that you know Kevin Hayes is too much of a depth player at this point in his career to move the needle all that much too and they they kind of took some chances um Verana Kasperi Kapanen like these just weren't necessarily gambles that have paid off completely for them again in terms of building a team around these players like you look at Zadora talking about building a team around McKinnon and it's it is such a contrast then to think about the types of players that are required in the construction of a roster to build a team around. It just takes something really special. And I don't think St. Louis has something special and they haven't tried to get it. To back up your point, I think maybe the biggest problem for me is I don't think they have a next wave of special guys. Yes, they have some first round picks. Jake Neighbors is having a decent year. 
but I think there are concerns about how high that ceiling is. You look at some of their other first round picks in the pipeline. Maybe they end up good. Obviously, you know, I'm not, I can't see the future, but Stenberg, a guy I never loved. Snuggerud is still plugging away in the NCAA, maybe a couple years down the road. Someone like a Theo Lindstein hasn't been great in Sweden for them. It doesn't feel like they have that next wave of true top end talent coming. And as you just mentioned, Megan, they haven't done anything to go out and get that talent. So getting a guy like Kevin Hayes, who's 31, injury prone on the back half of his career, it's not a move that a team stuck in the middle should really be making. And when you get rid of guys that have been there, Ryan, for example, and then if you're Cairo and Thomas, you think you can take the low now, you can be the guys. Some guys can't be the guys. They just can't. It's just reality. And time will tell if they can be the guys. But you sign those big deals and long-term deals, it's awesome. But now you're playing every night against Kel McCarr, Devontae's, and you know, it's just it's just reality of the beast, you know, and then some guys can't deliver. So it seems like those guys didn't deliver. And hey, if Bennington doesn't stand on his head this year, these guys are way down the line, I'm way down the, the standings. It it seems like the lesson learned from the one Stanley Cup that they did win was we're gonna have a low end one C forever and just hope that he has a crazy banana pants great year <laughs> and we can ride that and a fourth goaltender to the Stanley Cup. Like weird lesson to learn, yeah. Yeah, like like it just it looks like they've tried to recreate a team that had no business winning a Stanley cup and just got crazy pants hot and snuck one out and credit to him. Not, you know, I'm not that cup is forever, but ex- exactly flags fly forever. But the, the lessons learned from it of how to, how to build a, a, a sustainable cup team don't appear to have sunk in there. Um, Cause the, you look at all the champions around them and it's like, what are common threads here? And you're the one that stands out. You're the fluke here. Yep. Uh, and you're the one that did not learn that you were the fluke. You thought we were the real deal. And uh, for my money, great. <laughs> Let him sink, baby. It's my arch forever. But I, uh, I do wonder if at some point they're going to have to wake up and say, all right, we need to, we need to, Go way Take bigger this team than that. behind the woodshed. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to do it though. That they've got so much bad money on their books. I I don't so, know how you fix the defense. Yeah, I mean older players. You you're just talking about older players on bad contracts for multiple years. Yep. Even even a guy I I really like Braden Shen as a player. The decline is real, and that contract is onerous. It's and bad. I think that that is that's where they are with a lot of it. You know, they've, they've tried to make Colton Pareko the one D it didn't work. He needs to be a second pairing guy. Cause when he was a second pairing guy, he rocked as soon as they tried to turn the keys over to that defense to him, he collapsed. But their problem is Colton Pareko is signed to until the heat death of the universe. Like, they all are dude. <laughs> like half that roster has been given money. Like they've accomplished something as a group. And the guy that they let walk was Petrangelo. Yep. Over like some minor quibbling here and there. And then they just started handing out contracts left and right. And you're like, I don't know what you guys are doing. Um, I don't even, it's, I sound like I'm annoyed when I talk about it, mostly because people doing dumb things frustrates me. But in reality, St. Louis just smashing their head against the door and never getting through it instead of just opening it. Um, please keep at it. Highly entertaining for me. Pick ninth every yeah. single year. <laughs> all right looks like we've got one super chat and then we can uh wrap this show up three dollars from miss truly who says is everyone enjoying their snow day it's great i slept in it was awesome <laughs> i woke up Shoveling and i was like hours. what do i do <laughs> i was like all of our work from last night is done our pods at two. I don't have to worry about leaving early and driving and getting dressed. I don't have to worry about like being presentable to other humans. <laughs> what? Nice. Like, what do we do? Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. It's been great. My best part of the day was getting Eric's house tour. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, ac- the accidental Eric house tour was 
Excellent. Well, no, I didn't know that. I didn't think it was going to pick up like the kitchen was. So I ran to my daughter's room. There's a desk. See, sitting at her desk. It worked out. It well, worked out. A makeup desk, not a homework desk. Makeup. Or whatever. We couldn't. We couldn't tell what the difference was because all the rooms had giant TVs in them. It's true. And he just. They just kept happening. He was That's just like me. walking around, and it was like, "Oh, hey, here's another TV. Here's another TV. Here's another one." And it's just like, "What? What is this?" No. You're silly. We're good. <laughs> All right. On that note, we are going to get out of here for today. Thank you to everyone for tuning in for this remote snow day pod. It was a fun one. Uh, we will be back potting tomorrow. I, I don't know if we'll be remote again or in studio. It depends on how much snow comes down tonight. But we will be live either way tomorrow for another off day pod. So be sure to like and subscribe here on YouTube or catch us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting outlet. We appreciate y'all and we will talk to you tomorrow.